the priest of God. You're a guinea. Pipers! I've come to convert your land. Go back out. We don't want you here. To lead you back to the faith. Oh, we follow Christ. Kill him. Stone him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In 1833, as a young Anglican priest, I went abroad to Italy, as a young Italian Roman Catholic priest was soon to come to England. Mine was a holiday. His, I later learned, was a mission. Father, these sufferings I endure for thy sake and for the sake of thy kingdom. And yet my holiday was spoiled by a nagging desire to return home. A long illness had kept me in Palermo, finally recovered, but before starting from my inn, I sat down on my bed and began to sob bitterly. My servant, who had acted as my nurse, asked what ailed me. I could only answer, I have a work to do in England. Father, thou hast answered my prayers. After long delay, thou hast sent me here to England, far from my Italian home. And thou hast given me a share in thy sufferings, for which I am unworthy. But one thing more I beg of thee, the one thing for which my entire life on earth has been lived, for which I would gladly give my very life, for which I pray with most fervency. I pray for the conversion of England. I was aching to get home, yet for want of a vessel I was kept at Palermo for three weeks. I began to visit the churches, and they calmed my impatience, though I did not attend any services. At last, I got off in an orange boat bound for Marseille. We were becalmed for a whole week in the Straits of Bonifacio, and it was there that I wrote the lines, Lead Kindly Light, which have since become so well known. Lead kindly light, lead down beyond, amid the encircling gloom, Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. In a long course of years, I have made many mistakes. I have nothing of that high perfection which belongs to the writings of the saints. Namely, that error cannot be found in them. But, what I think I may claim through all that I have written is this. An honest intention. An absence of private ends. A temper of obedience. A willingness to be corrected. A dread of error and a desire to serve Holy Church. Yes, I have always striven to serve the Holy Catholic Church, though I am beginning to wonder where the Church really resides, where it really is. I sing a lamentation of this land. They have sinned against thee. They have forsaken thee, the fountain of living waters, and they have abandoned thy holy spouse, the Catholic Church. Behold, how our inheritance is passed into the hands of strangers. Our sacraments, which thou didst give to us, are in the hands of heretical ministers. Alas, my God, alas, divine Jesus, alas for these holy churches. Behold it, O Lord, behold it, I beseech thee. For this, my friends, is my sermon on Christian love. A love that saves us. 
A love that makes demands of us. A love that transforms us, that tries us in the furnace, that burns away our impurities. This is truly the love of God and not what we in the church have made of it. Many schools of religion and ethics are to be found among us. And they all profess to magnify in one shape or another what they consider the principle of love. But what they lack is that key element without which love becomes mere sentimentality, namely, the wrath of God. I see it all. The vineyard, once favored and elect of the Lord, is turned into a wilderness. They have enriched themselves and their spoils, and they have taken from it its hedge which heretofore surrounded it, the hedge of the Catholic faith. And behold, Every wild beast hath made it his abode. Every unbeliever hath here found a home. Every atheist here finds an asylum. Yea, this is the advantage we have received from Luther, from Calvin, from Cranmer, Knox, and the other heresiarchs. Yea. Our just God is angry with his vineyard and has commanded no more his clouds to rain upon it the needful water. O oh Lord, send your showers upon us. Convert us, O oh Lord, to thee and we shall be converted. Renew our days as they were at the beginning of our conversions. Here then is our want at the present day. For this we must pray that a reform may come in the spirit and power of Elijah. If it be thy will that I should die before I see this accomplished, I shall die contented, only if I am assured that it shall one day come to pass after my death. Yea, I am willing to die this very instant or to endure the heaviest temporal calamity only on the condition that England returns to the true faith. I ask not, O Lord, to be the minister of so great a work. No, O Lord, to thee do I leave it to choose the minister of thy mercies. Only do I beg of thee the salvation of my dear brethren. As I was engaged in writing my work upon the Arians, as I read further and further the fathers of the church in the lives of the early Christians who opposed the great heresy of their day, it became clear to me that the vital question was, how are we to keep the church from being liberalized? All of my life, I have resisted to the best of my powers the spirit of liberalism in religion. It is a snare overspreading the whole earth. Liberalism is the doctrine that there is no positive truth in religion, but that one creed is as good as another. And this is the teaching which is gaining substance and force daily. It is inconsistent with any recognition of any religion as true. Liberalism in religion is destroying religion and society both. Never was there a device of the enemy so cleverly framed and with such promise of success. And to combat this, I have crusaded all my life. But in combating liberalism. I have had to take a stand for truth, 
indeed for the way, the truth, and the life that I have found that the errors which I had to combat were errors within my own heart. Errors, I am sad to say, within my own Church of England. Newman, your latest tract is far too Catholic. I'm sorry, Your Grace. As your bishop, I have the authority to condemn it. Do not condemn it. Allow it to go forth. Your sermons are becoming too notorious. I will step down from the pulpit. I will cease to publish tracts and pamphlets. Only do not quash this latest one. You are offering a compromise? A middle way? Anything to save tract 90. It contains truth which must be heard. My brother bishops and I accept your offer of compromise. You are to keep to the small parish of Littlemore, quit the Tractarian movement, refrain from preaching at St. Mary's in Oxford, and in return we will neither quash your latest track nor criticize you. It was the world against Newman, and yet I retreated to a position of compromise and began to study, to confront the central question before me. Clearly the Protestant sects did not carry on the Apostolic Catholic Church in its fullness. Perhaps even the Church of England did not. But did Rome? I could not see how, for much of Rome's doctrine appeared to be corrupt, to have no basis in scripture, to be invented whole cloth and not to be woven from the original cloak of Jesus, the unchanging deposit of faith that was given to the apostles. I began to research the matter, and as I dug further and further into the history of the early church, I became more and more convinced of something, that this one thing at least is certain. Whatever history teaches, whatever it omits, whatever it exaggerates and extenuates, whatever it says and unsays, the Christianity of history is not Protestantism. If ever there were a safe truth, it is this. To be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. Little more, October 8th, 1845. I am this night expecting Father Dominic, the Passionist, who, from his youth, has been led to have distinct and direct thoughts, first of the countries of the North, then of England, after 30 years almost, waiting, he was without his own act sent here. He does not know of my intention, but I mean to ask of him admission into the one fold of Christ. Newman, <laughs> oh, this rain, what took you so long? I begin to wonder that myself. Dr. Newman, I must say that the last time I was here I did not... Uh, Dr. Newman? Father, I beg you, will you hear my confession and receive me into the Catholic Church? Now may thy servant depart in peace. We reached Littlemore about an hour before midnight, and I took up my position before the fire to dry myself. And what a spectacle it was for me to see at my feet John Henry Newman begging me 
to hear his confession and admit him into the bosom of the Catholic Church. And there by the fire, he began his general confession with extraordinary humility and devotion. On the following morning, Feast of St. Francis Borgia, I said Holy Mass for the first time using the very desk at which he had done his writing, which now became an altar of sacrifice. <laughs>